Grizzlies Growls presents Stories from the Hibernation, read by David Grizzly Smith. The Federalist Papers, Essays on the New Constitution, written by Alexander Hamilton, John Jay, and James Madison, under the nom de plume of Publius, read by David Grizzly Smith. Hello, I'm David Grizzly Smith. I'm fairly sure I want to record the Federalist Papers. Seems a little bit late to say that, but even so. There are two reasons I'm not sure I should try. One, there's a whole lot of Federalist Papers. There are 85 essays considered to be part of the Federalist Papers. Each one of them is quite long. Each one might take an hour of audio, just straight up recording. That's a lot of recording. Then you figure about three hours of editing, maybe more, for each hour of audio, so it's not exactly a small project. Then there's the history. Now, the Federalist Papers were written by James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton to convince the citizens of the state of New York to ratify this new document. Uh, Madison and Hamilton were part of the Constitutional Convention that actually wrote the Constitution. The essays, the Federalist essays, were published under the nom de plume of Publius in newspapers in the state of New York and syndicated to papers across uh, the other states. Now, remember, the Constitution was, at, of course, at that time, not the law of the land. The Articles of Confederation and Perpetual Union were the law of the land. And the Constitution wasn't a done deal. Now, the original intent of the Founding Fathers was the free and independent states mentioned in the Declaration of Independence. States, under the old definition, if you will, sovereign nations. The Articles of Confederation were only to provide a mechanism to do those things that absolutely had to be done collectively, couldn't be done individually by those sovereign nations, not effectively anyway, and to provide a framework for dealings between these independent states and otherwise ensure the very limited confederation government didn't interfere with the self-governing states. But the Articles hadn't worked well at all for a number of reasons. Ask your history teacher. Then the Constitutional Convention was intended to create a new government that would work. My understanding, actually, is that the uh, Convention was originally directed to amend the existing Articles of Confederation. Not exactly what happened. So that's got to be an interesting story, too. Now, there wasn't only one way the new government could be formed. The Convention came to a conclusion in creating the Constitution. It wasn't the only possible conclusion. The papers are often cited as a source for the intent of the writers of the Constitution. I suppose that's fair enough. Uh, in part because Madison and Hamilton were actually there. Um, also, it was written by essentially the winners of the debate, as winners always write history. On the other hand, there's a whole collection of papers, pamphlets, and flyers from smart people of the time who disagreed with the Constitution as written. Uh, one fellow published his whole collection in six volumes called the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, that too, could be considered a part of the intent of the founders, those founders whose views didn't win. My understanding is both were written during the period when everyone knew the articles would be replaced by something, but it wasn't settled exactly what, at least not entirely. The winners had a lot of influence. Actually, part of that influence was the Federalist Papers themselves. So it doesn't feel entirely honest to present the papers without making sure the listeners, that would be you, Understand that the Federalist Papers were intended to convince you the Constitution was the right option, the only practical option. Listen as if it wasn't a done deal. There are other ways this could have gone. 
Imagine what it was like then. It was only a few years after the revolution. It was 1787, I think. 1786, 1787, right in that period. One system of government was not working. Another one was offered. Everyone in the country was asked to make a decision. Now, probably the choice was going to be this new constitution. Very wise men, those who led the revolution, the Congress that created the Confederation, came up with it originally, but it was up to every citizen. Now, that would have been you. There are other parts of the papers that don't sit well with me. You'll note, uh, when I get to it, you'll note in the second essay, John Jay says, the country succeeded because Americans were one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, very similar in their manners and customs. Now, I don't know if that was ever true. And, of course, times have changed just a little bit since then. So it seems like I really ought to record the Anti-Federalist Papers too, all six volumes. And I really don't want to do that much, at least not right now. But the upside of recording all 85 essays in the Federalist Papers is that there are 85 essays I'd know what I'd be doing for possibly a year or two, and I'd have plenty of content for a long while. So I guess I'll give it a try. Uh, I found a copy of the papers on congress.gov, which was in turn apparently taken from Project Gutenberg. Given that and the age of the essays over two centuries, I'm pretty sure the papers are in public domain. It's worth a shot, and it's important stuff. Especially now, I think. Enjoy. Federalist number one. General introduction. For the Independent Journal. Author, Alexander Hamilton. To the people of the State of New York. After an unequivocal experience of the inefficiency of the subsisting federal government, you are called upon to deliberate a new constitution for the United States of America. The subject speaks of its own importance comprehending in its consequences nothing less than the existence of the Union, the safety and welfare of the parts of which it is composed, the fate of an empire in many respects the most interesting in the world. It has been frequently remarked that it seems to have been reserved to the people of this country, by their conduct and example, to decide the important question whether societies of men are really capable or not of establishing good government from reflection and choice, or whether they are forever destined to depend for their political constitutions on accident and force. If there be any truth in the remark, the crisis at which we are arrived may with propriety be regarded as the era in which that decision is to be made, and a wrong election of the part we shall act may, in this view, deserve to be considered as the general misfortune of mankind. This idea will add the inducements of philanthropy to those of patriotism, to heighten the solicitude which all considerate and good men must feel for the event. Happy will it be if our choice should be directed by a judicious estimate of our true interests, unperplexed and unbiased by considerations not connected with the public good. But this is a thing more ardently to be wished than seriously to be expected. The plan offered to our deliberations affects too many particular interests, innovates upon too many local institutions not to involve in its discussion a variety of objects foreign to its merits, and of views, passions, and prejudices little favorable to the discovery of truth. Among the most formidable of the obstacles which the new Constitution will have to encounter may readily be distinguished the obvious interest of a certain class of men in every state to resist all changes which may hazard a diminution of the power, emolument, and consequence of the offices they hold under the state establishments, and the perverted ambition of another class of men who will either hope to aggrandize themselves by the confusions of their country— 
or will flatter themselves with fairer prospects of elevation from the subdivision of the empire into several partial confederacies than from its union under one government. It is not, however, by design to dwell upon observations of this nature. I am well aware that it would be disingenuous to resolve indiscriminately the opposition of any set of men, merely because their situations might subject them to suspicion, into interested or ambitious views. Candor will oblige us to admit that even such men may be actuated by upright intentions, and it cannot be doubted that much of the opposition which has made its appearance, or may hereafter make its appearance, will spring from sources, blameless at least, if not respectable, the honest errors of minds led astray by preconceived jealousies and fears, so numerous indeed and so powerful are the causes which serve to give a false bias to the judgment that we, upon many occasions, see wise and good men, on the wrong as well as on the right side of questions, of the first magnitude to society. This circumstance, if duly attended to, would furnish a lesson of moderation to those who were ever so much persuaded of their being in the right in any controversy." And a further reason for caution in this respect might be drawn from the reflection that we are not always sure that those who advocate the truth are influenced by purer principles than their antagonists. Ambition, avarice, personal animosity, party opposition, and many other motives not more laudable than these are apt to operate as well upon those who support as those who oppose the right side of a question. Were there not even these inducements to moderation, nothing could be more ill-judged than that intolerant spirit which has at all times characterized political parties. For in politics, as in religion, it is equally absurd to aim at making proselytes by fire and sword. Heresies in either can rarely be cured by persecution. And yet, however just these sentiments will be allowed to be, we have already sufficient indications that it will happen in this, as in all former cases of great national discussion. A torrent of angry and malignant passions will be let loose. To judge from the conduct of the opposite parties, we shall be led to conclude that they will mutually hope to evince the justness of their opinions and to increase the number of their converts by the loudness of their declamations and the bitterness of their invectives. An enlightened zeal for the energy and efficiency of government will be stigmatized as the offspring of a temper fond of despotic power and hostile to the principles of liberty. An overscrupulous jealousy of danger to the rights of the people, which is more commonly the fault of the head than of the heart, will be represented as mere pretense and artifice, the stale bait for popularity at the expense of the public good. It will be forgotten, on the one hand, that jealousy is the usual concomitant of love, and that the noble enthusiasm of liberty is apt to be infected with a spirit of narrow and illiberal distrust. On the other hand, it will be equally forgotten that the vigor of government is essential to the security of liberty, that in the contemplation of a sound and well-informed judgment, their interest can never be separated, and that a dangerous ambition more often lurks behind the specious mask of zeal for the rights of the people than under the forbidden appearance of zeal for the firmness and efficiency of government. History will teach us that the former has been found a much more certain road to the introduction of despotism than the latter and that of those men who have overturned the liberties of republics, the greatest number, have begun their career by paying an obsequious court to the people, commencing demagogues and ending tyrants. In the course of the preceding observations, I have had an eye, my fellow citizens, to putting you upon your guard, against all attempts from whatever quarter, to influence your decision in a matter of the utmost moment to your welfare by any impressions other than those which may result from the evidence of truth. You will, no doubt, at the same time, have collected from the general scope of them that they proceed from a source not unfriendly to the new Constitution. Yes, my countrymen, I own to you that, after having given it an attentive consideration, I am clearly of opinion it is in your interest to adopt it. 
I am convinced that this is the safest course for your liberty, your dignity, and your happiness. I affect not reserves which I do not feel. I will not amuse you with an appearance of deliberation when I have decided. I frankly acknowledge to you my convictions, and I will freely lay before you the reasons on which they are founded. The consciousness of good intentions disdains ambiguity. I shall not, however, multiply professions on this head. My motives must remain in the depository of my own breast. My arguments will be open to all, and may be judged by all. They shall at least be offered in a spirit which will not disgrace the cause of truth. I propose, in a series of papers, to discuss the following interesting particulars. The Utility of the Union to your political prosperity, the insufficiency of the present confederation to preserve that union, the necessity of a government at least equally energetic with the one proposed to the attainment of this objective, the conformity of the proposed constitution to the true principles of republican government, its analogy to your own state constitution, and lastly, the additional security which its adoption will afford to the preservation of that species of government, to liberty, and to prosperity. In the progress of this discussion I shall endeavor to give a satisfactory answer to all the objections which shall have made their appearance, that may seem to have any claim to your attention. It may perhaps be thought superfluous to offer arguments to prove the utility of the Union, a point, no doubt, deeply engraved on the hearts of the great body of the people in every state, and one which it may be imagined has no adversaries. But the fact is that we already hear it whispered in the private circles of those who oppose the new Constitution that the thirteen states are of too great extent for any general system, and that we must of necessity resort to separate confederacies of distinct portions of the whole. Uh, this doctrine will, in all probability, be gradually propagated till it has votaries enough to countenance an open avowal of it. For nothing can be more evident to those who are able to take an enlarged view of the subject than the alternative of an adoption of the new Constitution or a dismemberment of the Union. It will therefore be of use to begin by examining the advantages of that Union the certain evils, the probable dangers to which every state will be exposed from its dissolution. This shall accordingly constitute the subject of my next address. Publius Thank you for listening to The Federalist Papers by James Madison, John Jay, and Alexander Hamilton, read by David Grizzly Smith. The full text of The Federalist Essays is available at congress.gov, among many other places. The theme music, Johann Sebastian Bach's Prelude in C Major, is provided by Kevin McLeod of Incompetech.com. Comment at grizzliesgrowls.com or at speakpipe.com forward slash grizzliesgrowls. These recordings are offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives, 3.0 license. That means please make copies. Please share these recordings, but don't change them, don't sell them, and do tell people where you got them. If you like this presentation, leave a comment and a rating on iTunes or anywhere else you can. Blog about it, podcast about it, tweet about it, tell everyone, and thank you. Thank you for listening to Stories from the Hibernation. Theme music for the series is Canon in D by Pacabell, performed by Owen Poteet of owenpoteet.com. 
Comment or contribute on the website at grizzly.libsyn.com. This program is offered under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Thank you.